Church. I am so thrilled to be with you this morning and we want to say a big hello to Catherine Kumar. Yay! Um, she has finally made it. We are thrilled to have her as part of our living room family. Um, we have prayed for her and Matt's reunion and we are so thrilled that they um, are now together as husband and wife. Absolutely excited about that. If she's sitting next to you, please give her a big hug. Give her a big welcome to our group. The rest of us will get to meet her over the next few weeks as we have all prayed for her. And it's um, we just want to welcome her into our family. It's amazing. She came here and straight away says, OK, what can I do? Should I do some cleaning? And here she is busy around the place already. So she just has a wonderful heart. So welcome, Catherine, to our family. OK, next week, what's going on? It's the fifth week of the month, so normally we don't have a, a traditional regular service. But what we have decided to do is we are going to watch a wonderful documentary called Send Proof. So we will be showing it in Melton at 10 a.m. And so everybody's invited. We will have lunch afterwards, so please stay. Bring a plate of food to share and we'll all have um, a shared lunch. We will not have kids or youth ministry um, that particular Sunday. So please make sure you bring something for them to do either during the service um, or they can obviously sit in and watch the documentary. And then after the service, there will be a time of us chatting about the movie and what we what we got out of it, what are our thoughts on it, what are our thoughts on miracles, have we experienced them? Maybe we can even pray for some and get, you know, experience the miracles in our midst. That's the whole point of it. In um, That's Melton, 10 a.m., 5 p.m. It's going to be happening in Torquay. So once again, if, if you can bring a plate of supper to share um, and then we'll be doing the, the same thing there at 5 p.m. But now let's get ready for the word. Let's get ready to hear a wonderful message and I'll t speak with you guys shortly. Hi, Living Room Church family. It feels like ages since I've been with you in this way. For the past couple of weeks, we had both Kaz sharing an amazing message and Julie sharing an amazing message. But it is so beautiful to be with you again in this way. But you know what, today, today is a message that relates to every single one of us. I'm sorry, but you can't say, oh man, I hope she's listening to this. I'm sure this is going to change her life. This is for all of us. We can't handball the responsibility to anybody today. Every single one of us have got a part to play in today's message. So Holy Spirit, help us. Holy Spirit, keep us alert, keep us sharp, keep us listening so we can take what we hear today and live it for your glory, Jesus. Amen. All right, so <laughs> I've been thinking about today's topic probably for about three or four weeks. And it's something that, you know, I notice when God wants to get my attention for a certain um, topic or theme it's like he doesn't leave me alone with it so over the past few weeks I've been unpacking it with him and even in my own life checking my own heart because I have to live it before I can preach it amen but I believe God wants me to share this with us as a church family today this message feels more like a a family chat because I feel like a spiritual parent right now I speak to you from a place of fatherly, fatherly love, because every now and then God wants us to stop, to consider where we are and be aware of what can potentially hold us back from moving forward. But before we get into the guts of today's message, I want to set it up for us. There was a movie that came out in 1995. Some of you weren't even born then, but 1995. It was called The Usual Suspects. There was a great quote in that movie which has stuck with me for years, and it's this. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Hmm. Now, well, there are times where the devil's work is very obvious, like what we've seen in the horrors of war, what we see with what Russia is doing in the Ukraine. Now. I mean, it's obvious that the devil has his fingerprints all over that mess. We see it in the way certain people behave with such high levels of evil. Those things are obvious. But you know, much of the time, 
The devil's ways are quite subtle. They are underhanded, crafty, sly, and sneaky. He twists and distorts things just enough to not reveal his intentions. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it even looks logical and quite common. You see, the devil doesn't want you to see him in a way that exposes him for who he really is. He resides in the hidden and the dark places. He wants you to to not look to him to blame. He wants you to shift the blame upon others and also to to blame God. He wants humanity to, to fight each other, to turn our attention away from the real cause of the trouble and from where it comes. He wants us to think that the problem is what our emotions feel and and what our physical eyes see, when in reality, the issue needs to be dealt with in the spiritual realm. Satan can sometimes be like a puppeteer pulling the strings of people and situations to do his dirty work while he hides in the darkness, rubbing his grubby hands in delight as humanity slowly but surely falls into his deception. Now, while I'm not interested in being devil-focused, you know that, but wisdom is calling us to be aware of what's going on so that we can flow unrestricted into all that God has for us. And let me tell you, dear church, God has a lot of great things for us ahead. So lately, as I'm interacting with God about the the life of our church, where we are and where we're going, I've noticed lately that God is wanting me to to spend some time exposing the old enemy because he has caused so much trauma and trouble, particularly in the last couple of years, that it needs to be seen for what it is. So let me share why I'm bringing this up today. As we at the Living Room Church have transitioned into a new vision, at the start of this year, as you know, we transitioned into a new and exciting vision. And I'm so encouraged by what I've been seeing and hearing from many of you. We're seeing people that were disconnected from any form of church now reconnecting with others and growing in their faith. We're seeing people rise up and take ownership of their part in their spiritual family. We're seeing people press in for miracles, praying and prophesying over each other, people being touched deeply by God. We're seeing a shift from a leadership-heavy church structure to one of family where everyone gets to be involved and have a voice. We're seeing relationships deepen. Love, grow, unity, thrive, and spiritual maturity increase. I'm so thankful for all of that. But I'm also aware that not only do we have God's full attention and that he is well pleased, but we also have Satan's attention. And he is not pleased. He hates what he is seeing. And he will not just sit back and let it happen. Ha. Please, please don't let that scare you. But rather be encouraged, dear church, because we are pushing against the forces of darkness, against the plans of the devil, who wants to silence and disempower God's people in the church. We have his attention because he knows what happens. Get this. He knows what happens when God's people truly discover who they are and why they are here. Beyond all the systems of religion, beyond all the systems and structures and formats of church, we're breaking free from anything that's contained us. That excites me. And as amazing as it is with what God is doing right now, let's not for one moment think that we can get casual or complacent about what is against us. Now, while we are still in the early stages of this new way of doing life together as a church, today God wants me to address a very very critical issue. And it's this. We all have a part to play in this. 
And that will determine our next phase of seeing growth in the life of our church family. So I want you to consider this statement. And maybe, how about, we, how about you say it with me? Okay, you ready? Here we go. And I'm going to explain it once we've said it. I am responsible for my point of entry. Now, what do I mean by that? You see, the point of entry that I'm talking about here is in the Christian's life. And that, of course, extends as we do life together. There is a point of entry in the life of our church as well. But it is that place, that doorway, that the devil wants to access and gain entry. It is that point of entry in your mind, your will, your emotions. It's the way you, the way you think, which filters through in the way you interact with others and with God. But it's that place that the evil one wants to get into. He wants to call, cause all sorts of trouble and destruction, but he cannot do so until he gets access into that point of entry in your heart. It is the place of your, the core of your being. It is like the, the control center of your life because it shapes the way you think, the way you treat others, the way you interact with God, the way you live out your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if the devil can get access to that place, if he finds a point of entry, he can cause such great damage that it can literally shut you down steal you away from your destiny, but also damage those who are doing life with you. Here is something I need you to understand about this point of entry. You get to decide who has access to your inner world. You have the power over that. You have control over that. No one else. You get to decide, dear one, who has, who has access to your inner world. The entry point to your inner world is totally under your control. You are not a victim. We can't use that as an excuse. <laughs> you hold the key and you decide who enters and who doesn't, including the devil. Now, I'm going to say something now that I really need you to understand. And perhaps for some of you, this may come as a new revelation. Look at this. The only way that Satan and his demons can get access to your inner world is by you handing over the key of your agreement. That's the only way. I need to say that again because that's really an important part of today's message. The only way that Satan and his demons can get access to your inner world is by you handing over the key of your agreement. You see, your agreement becomes a, as I said, a point of entry to Satan's plans against you and against those in your world. And don't miss this. This not only, this not only affects you, but it also affects us your spiritual church family. So I bring this up now because we are entering a phase in the life of our church that if we are not aware of it, we can invite division. We can block the flow of what God is doing. And sometimes it's done in a very subtle way. Now I realize there are people sometimes that are planted by the devil in churches to 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 uh, set the or to fulfill the, the the agenda of what Satan wants to do in that church, they come in and they they make comments to divide and and they stir up dissension. They they create factions and and groups and and divisions start occurring. I have met a few of these people over time, but most of the time, this is done in a very subtle way. You see, Satan sees what's happening here. He sees how we are moving into a very powerful move of God. And you know what? He hates it. It should not surprise us that he should want to be involved in this. This is one of his oldest tricks. But sadly, 
so many in the church continue to fall victim to this trick because they ignore him. They don't expose him for what is really happening and for who he really is. So let me show you why I said that, as we, why, why we are, as I described, entering a phase where this issue can become very real. Look at this amazing quote, and I'm going to feed from this quote for the rest of our time together. It's a fact of earthly life that when God opens the windows of heaven to bless us, the devil opens the doors of hell to blast us. When God begins moving, the devil fires up all his artillery. I think it's wise for us to recognize that truth. You see, real life teaches us that whenever God moves and, and the church steps into a new phase of growth and maturity and almost like a spiritual upgrade, the devil is never far away from trying to get in, to force his way through a point of entry so that he can wreak havoc and cause that move of God, the people of God, to implode. So let's look at the example of the first church because I see this happening as we read it in as we read about them in the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 2, we see the mighty moment of, of the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we'll actually be looking at that in a couple of weeks. But we see the church being filled with the Holy Spirit and it caused such a stir in Jerusalem as people were wondering what was going on, what just happened, what is that, that noise, that rumbling. And, and Peter, I love Peter. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, he stands up to speak and preach an amazing message of the gospel to everyone that was there. And the Jerusalem was crowded, packed, packed, packed because of the festival that was going on. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, we read this. Look at this. It said, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. What is that? That is a blessing from heaven. That's what that quote says. It's a blessing from heaven. God has opened up the windows of heaven and blessed the people of God. Acts 2, 42 to 47 describes a most inspiring season as the first church was birthed and started walking together on the journey. It reads this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy. And generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, get this, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. What a mighty blessing from heaven. What a great, inspiring move of God. In Acts 3, we then read how Peter and, and John heal a lame beggar who was very well known in Jerusalem, healed him at the temple gates, and how all of Jerusalem was in a buzz as to what was going on. You see, this miracle was very public and very spectacular. Again, what an amazing blessing from heaven. But the very next thing that came was persecution. A blasting from hell. See, Peter and John were arrested. They began to feel the resistance head on. They felt the blasting from hell that was coming against them, that was trying to silence them, that was trying to shut them down. The battle became so intense, so real, that a lot was at stake in that very trying season. The enemy was fighting hard. The enemy wanted to shut down this sudden uprising of God's people and the birth and the growth of the first church. But as we know, God is never surprised by any of that. God is never prevented by Satan, nor is he ever affected by his agenda and his attacks. So the blessings of heaven continued despite 
the blasting of hell, trying to shut the church down. We then read in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, look at this. It said, all the believers were united in heart and mind. Don't miss that. All the believers, the church, were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. That's awesome, isn't it? There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Once again, church, the blessings of heaven were being poured out over and over and over again. No matter who or what tried to stop them, they never could. But get this. Listen, get this. Up until that point, the opposition, the resistance, the attacks were coming from outside of the church. But in Acts chapter 5, something changes, something shifts. Because that attack, that resistance had now leaked into the church community. And Satan got in and he began to cause a lot of trouble. Now here is what I want you to see. At this point, Satan had no chance of blasting his way into the church community because no one had given him, why? Because no one had given him a point of entry. The church was united. The church was strong and devoted. The church was full of faith, full of power, full of the zeal for God. But then a husband and wife by the names of Ananias and Sapphira conspired together to lie to the church leaders in relation to a financial gift that they were going to give. The Apostle Peter confronted them one by one and instantly we read they were both struck dead and it sent a shockwave throughout the church. I mean, come on, who's thankful that people don't get struck dead anymore for lying? <laughs> Whew. Anyway, so Acts, 5, chapter, Acts chapter 5 verse 11 tells us this after that pretty sobering moment great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened with such a mighty move of God with such incredible beautiful mind-blowing blessings from heaven which were being poured out upon the people of God all of a sudden this blasting from hell did not happen from outside it occurred from inside because someone, a husband and wife, had opened the point of entry and the devil gladly came in. Their agreement with what Satan wanted to do, with their lying, with their cheating, with their stealing from God, became the access point for the enemy and his evil agenda. And you know what? That's all that Satan was waiting for. Because he knew that that was all he had. He waited in the darkness for someone to give him access by their agreement. Do you see it? But as can be expected, the cycle continued. The blessings of heaven could not be stopped. And God kept on breathing upon his church. From Acts chapter 5 verse 11, we again read that miracles were commonplace among the people of God. People were healed, people were, were saved and delivered and the church was growing by the day. An amazing move. It got so amazing that we read in Acts chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, we read this. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow, oh, so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Blessings of heaven. Imagine being a part of such a great move of God. <sighs> but in the very next two verses, in Acts chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, 
the blasting of hell came. The disciples were arrested and yet another form of resistance came against them. What a relentless enemy we have. But again, when he comes from, the outs- from outside the church, it's not a shock. I mean, the devil's friends hate what God is doing and, and does. And of course, they try to oppose it and silence it. Of course, maybe you have people in your world who are anti-God and you feel the resistance. You, you, you feel the ridicule, the, um, the, the, the persecution even. And we should never be surprised, guys, when the systems of this world and the beliefs that are so anti-Christ push back against us. When people spew hate upon the people of God. I mean, just have a look how the media has ridiculed our Prime Minister Scott Morrison for his, for his faith in Jesus. It's shocking. Well, actually, it's not shocking. <laughs> we should never be surprised when the world around us ridicules us, judges us, criticises, mocks us. But again, it takes a whole new meaning when it leaks into the church family and Satan works from within. Let's see what happened next. Take it up with me from Acts chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 42 to chapter 6, verse 1. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they continue to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Now, perhaps their complaint was justified. There was a problem that needed to be solved. But did you notice where in those verses the point of entry occurred? Did you see the access point? It said that there arose rumblings of discontent. Other versions of the Bible describe it this way. A complaint arose. Another one said this, protests were made. I personally like the message paraphrase of it where it says, hard feelings developed. (laughs) Oh, Lord help us. The point is this. Satan wanted so badly to divide what God was uniting, to destroy what God was building and to weaken what God was fortifying that he knew that his only chance was to get in on the inside. So he waited in the hidden places, in the darkness for someone to give give him a point of entry. He could not do it until the people on the inside gave the devil that access point. The key to open the door and invite Satan in was through the rumblings of discontent, the complaints, the protests, and the hard feelings of offense. And you know what, church? He still looks for the same points of entry. Please don't miss this. We are only as strong as the unity we protect and the agreements we make. Hmm. We can work so hard establishing a culture of love in our church to to protect our unity and have committed, devoted friendships and have a culture of grace and honour. But you know what? It can take One person, one moment, one argument, one complaint, one disagreement, one point of offence to weaken what we have built over the years. Church family, please hear me now. Please hear me. This is a real threat. And the devil is crouching at our door, wanting to come in. And my prayer is that not a single one of us will give the devil a point of entry because of the way we think, the way we speak, and the way we treat each other. Can you see how we all must be alert and aware of this? Can you see how it takes every single one of us to take responsibility, 
to refuse the devil a point of entry because it doesn't take much to compromise our strength if what we are building with God has a point of access to darkness. I know God's power is always greater. I know light always defeats darkness. I get that. I get that. But we see in the book of Acts how a choice that someone makes, even something as subtle as a complaint, gives the enemy access to cause a lot of trouble. And you know what? As as your pastor, I pray hard against any division and any offense in our church because I've seen it destroy friendships. I've seen it compromise the strength of our body of believers over the years. You know, we've had to call people up on this a few times, sadly, because, because the devil, if he's, let, if he's allowed to have free reign in this area, he can cause a lot of damage. Over the years of leading this church, I've come across a few people which could have potentially caused great division and destruction. Behind the scenes, they would criticize and ridicule leadership. They would tell lies. They would bring people in to their opinions. Now, thankfully, God had warned us and, and we quickly addressed it. And sadly, some damage was done and relationships were broken. You know, we we have even seen this occur recently, how, how a global, a massive global church like Hillsong have been severely hit by Satan's evil attack against them. Somehow he, he weaved his way in, and I guarantee this to you, that if you would trace where the root cause of this had occurred, you would find a point of entry through someone's agreement to sin or even a collective group with an evil agenda. Church, listen, let's not get complacent about this. Let's not get distracted by so many other sideline issues and, and, and loud voices. But also, let's not get distracted by what Satan is trying to stir up. Don't give him the satisfaction. Don't give him the joy of wreaking havoc in what we are responsible for. So like the early church, the attacks, the persecution, the pressure of the devil, none of that could stop them from changing the world. And the same goes for us. So I close with this. It might sound cliche, but we are all in this together. Now, if you grew up watching High School Musical, you're probably singing the song, we're all in this together. Don't do that. (laughs) You see, your words and your actions affect me. My words and my actions affect you. The strength, the unity and the future of our church does not rest on me alone. We all have a part to play here in blocking all access points to the devil. So how about we end our time together with a united declaration of our commitment to be a church that frustrates the devil because he cannot find any agreement. He cannot find any point of entry. So how about together we declare this? I am a vital part of the strength and unity of my church family. My words and my actions are a fortified wall that the devil cannot break through. I refuse to be offended by others. I refuse to agree with the devil's lies and instead choose to see my church family through the eyes of my Father God. The devil will not have my agreement, and I therefore close all points of entry to his evil agenda. I am alert, and I am wise to discern the subtle and the obvious attempts of the devil to gain entry. No, not today, devil, not ever. Oh, I can hear the faith rumbling as you declare that with me. Church, let's continue in the outpouring of the blessings of heaven 
And let's never be discouraged or stopped by the blastings of hell. Because you know what? You know the verse, if God is for us, who can be against us? Hmm. So if you're watching this in a home church setting, then of course there are some questions, suggested questions and conversation points in the video description below. And I hope that you, as you unpack this together, it will help you to activate this in your own life and in our, in our church family. But let's pray. And then we're going to spend time in reflection. We're going to watch a video, short clip, and then have a wonderful song of worship as we seek the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom how to live this out. So Lord God, I thank you for who you are and what you are doing. I'm so encouraged, God, that no matter how severe the blastings of hell may be, you are always greater. Lord, you are never intimidated by the devil. You are never um, at the, you are never hijacked by the devil's agenda or his plans. As a matter of fact, you don't even consider him. You leave him to us. <laughs> so as we walk in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, we shut every door, every point of access to the enemy's evil agenda. We say, no devil, not today, not ever. So Lord, you have our commitment. We once again pledge to you that we will protect the unity of the brethren, of the family of God. God, we will stand firm and refuse the things that Satan wants us to come into agreement with. And we say yes to you. Yes, Jesus, whatever you wanna do, Jesus, we're going to do this your way. I pray this in faith and I thank you for your agreement, Lord God, with our words of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an amazing day, dear church. Have an amazing day. May you live this out this week and ongoing in the months and the years ahead. Because what we have is too precious to allow the enemy to have anything to do with. I seal it in Jesus' name. I love you guys and I'll see you next time.
just heard none of us want to give the, the, the enemy any room or any access points into our lives, into our family, into our church or into even our finances. And so one of the things that the Bible does say is that the love of money is the root of all evil. And this is something that we totally believe because we see how it can ruin and how it can rule people's lives. We do not want to be people like that. Instead, we want to freely, as the Word of God says, freely you have received, freely given. We God has given us our jobs, has given us um, a different way of uh, lots of different ways of making income. We don't want to love it so much that it actually becomes um, a stumbling block in our lives and it can cause um, deep roots to come and an access point for the enemy to come and um, yeah, rule our lives through money. So today, as you give, may you give with the right heart. May you check your heart on that. Don't we don't want the enemy. Uh, we don't want God to have to pry it out of your fingers, no. But rather that we just give because it is um, a blessing to give to the Lord. And so, um, lots of different ways to give. You guys know what to do. We are very excited to see both groups next week. So have an amazing week. God bless you, and um, we'll see you on Sunday, hopefully. If not during the week, there's lots of stuff. Hop on Facebook, hop online, and find out what's going on in your area this coming week. Love you guys. Bye.